want to start with this. Um, there's a phrase that I've heard my whole life. You guys have heard it. Um, it's this idea that no good deed goes unpunished. And there's a sense at times, I think, that your reward for doing something selfless will result in difficulty or complexity coming into your life. Um, I think about actor Jeremy Renner. I don't know if there's any Jeremy Renner fans. Hawkeye, right? No? This is the second service in a row or it's just me. Okay, good, 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 good. You don't know as an introvert the nightmare when you ask someone, do you know somebody? And everybody's just like, Pfft. Um, It was New Year's Day and uh, he gets in his snow plow. His nephew is stuck and stranded in the snow. So he gets his snow plow, goes down to help out his nephew. And after pulling him out, he's standing there just kind of chatting chatting him up, and um, the snowplow starts to move, and neither of them realize that the snowplow is moving. And he ends up getting ran over by this thing. And he breaks like 30 bones, takes him over a year to recover. Um, if, if you've seen recent interviews with him, he still has not fully recovered. In fact, I heard last night in an interview where he said he felt like he would be dealing with this for the rest of his life, and I'm like, yeah, you got run over by a snowplow. Not, not like a mower with a, like if you've seen, like it's a legit something you see when you go out west kind of snowplow. And maybe you've seen some of the headlines or some of the clips. Uh, it really is amazing that he is still alive. And believe it or not, that's exactly kind of the flavor or the flair of Hebrews chapter 11. If there was a single thought that I'd like us to embrace as we wrap up this part of our discussion would be this, that the pressure is not the problem. The pressure that you and I are facing is not the actual problem. I'm gonna pick this up, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. It says, and what more shall I say? So this is like following just a, you know, 31 verses of, of just person after person after person. What more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon or Barak or Samson or Jephthah about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, <clears throat> who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning and they were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something far better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Glad you came to church today. That was an uplifting passage, wasn't it? <laughs> in the original language, in the Greek, what we just read together is one long sentence. And it's just to illustrate that having talked about Abel's faith and Enoch's faith, having wrestled with Noah's faith and Moses' faith, that all of these accounts of men and women who believed God, it makes the case for the writer's argument that Jesus is greater than anything any human being can do. And what made each of them great and what made God wanna put their portrait up in his picture room was not what they actually did, it's because they lived a life of faith. Remember back to week one, if you can remember that long ago. <clears throat> this chapter was written for a specific reason. <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, the writer lays out faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And the reason that the writer is making this declaration is it's an attempt to clearly lay out this concept of living your life by faith because it was being challenged. There were Jewish people who had decided they were gonna to try to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, and they were being tempted to abandon their faith and go back to Judaism. They had come out of that system of faith. They were being tempted to go back to Moses or 
to a physical temple or to keeping the red letter of the law. It was this pull back to a more visible religion, what they could see and what they could touch, what they could ultimately understand, and the bottom line is it's what they could actually handle. Instead of the invisible realities of following God through faith in Jesus, what they actually could not see. So to put it simply, this chapter shows up at a time where people were losing their faith. And so by going down this list, the writer's making the point that Jesus is better than religion. It may not provide you with the ego boost that you feel like you need, but it comes through when it matters the most. And so he gives us just this enormous cascading explosion of men and women who've come before us trying to show us of the possibilities of what might happen to a human life if you make the decision to walk by faith. And the common denominator in all of these people is this simple thing called courage. By faith, they did valiant and courageous things. Translation, they performed well under pressure. Pressure. It's that thing that irritates you when you feel it. Pressure's that thing that makes you feel like something must be going wrong when it enters into your life. Nobody likes pressure, and yet the reality is we all have to face it from time to time. I think about financial pressure. The economy's weird. Cost of living for some of us feels high. But some of us, because we make bad decisions. We live in a part of the world, right, where we are tempted every single day to live way above our means. We can at times um, convince ourselves that we need a certain lifestyle so that when everybody else around us, around us looks at us, they perceive that we're quote unquote successful, whatever that means. We can at times for sure be accomplices in our own suffering. Some of the pressure that you and I face every day is self-imposed, although it's not all of it. I think about pressure for the future. I decided months ago, I made a resolution. I am not gonna ask a single graduate what's next for you. Um, I feel like that's all they get asked right now. We're right at the end of graduation here in, in our city. Everybody wants to know, well, what are you gonna do? And there's all this pressure to have a really great answer, pressure to have these amazing plans, even though you're 18 years old. I think about kids that are graduating college. They're 22, 23, 24 years old, and everybody wants to know, what's next? How are you gonna go change the world? And some of them are like, I don't even know what I'm gonna do. The pressure is unbelievable. I think about relationship pressure. Like if you're married and you're honest, you face pressure from time to time. If you're a parent and you got kids, there's pressure. There's pressure in our jobs. It is literally everywhere. And the people who are celebrated in Hebrews chapter 11, they too dealt with pressure. And y'all listen, none of it was imagined. And none of it was self-imposed. This was like straight up, legit, real pressure. So as we've worked through this chapter, I made a list of some of that pressure. Um, some of it was mockery, right? They were made fun of, literally. For what? Why did people make fun of them? For doing what God told them to do, because it didn't make sense. Abraham was known as the father of many nations, yet he had no kids. Can you imagine when he went down DMV to change his name? Hey, I'm Abram, but I need to change to Abraham. Abraham what? Abraham, father of many nations. And you don't have any kids? This guy was beyond middle age when he got the call from God. Can you imagine the fun that people made of him? I think about Noah. Noah, go build a boat. Great, we're 100 miles from the nearest body of water. As near as we can tell, it had not ever yet rained. They're out in the middle of the desert. You think people made fun of him? Of course they did, until the first drop of rain started falling. I think about Moses. <clears throat> made a horrible decision, was running for his life. God called him. He could barely put two sentences together, and yet it was God who said, Moses, I need you to go to the most powerful person on this planet 
and convince him to let my people go. And then when y'all are gone, I need you to just start walking this way because I've got a promised land that I need you to lead the people into. People knew Moses. They knew his history. They tried to have a conversation with him. He wasn't the sharpest crayon in the box. And when he stands up and's like, hey, I got this message from God, do you think everybody was patting him on the back? Well, great, Moses, I can't wait to follow you. Of course not. Jeremiah, Jeremiah is another one, man. Prophet Jeremiah, how many of you love you some Jeremiah 29, 11? I know the plans God has for me, amen, amen. If you grew up in the South, in particular, your mama or your mama had that cross stitched in the bathroom, right? <laughs> Woo, I know the plans God has for me. We love it. But here's the deal, when he wrote it, nobody loved it. He was made fun of for his ministry. He was put into a pit and stoned to death by the people he was preaching to. Jeremiah never had one convert. He was known as the weeping prophet because that's how he spent most of his days. And yet Hebrews chapter 11 lifts that guy up and says, yo, Jeremiah was awesome. They were mocked for doing what God told them to do. So why do you think it would be any different for you? And why should I think it would be any different for me? You're gonna have an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend. You're gonna have somebody in your friend group that you hadn't seen in a while. They're, oh, you got Jesus now. I remember what you used to be like. Who are you fooling? I think about this church Back in the late 60s, 12 families from East Knoxville felt God calling them to come all the way out to West Knoxville, which back then, people thought they were insane. People actually told them, it ain't gonna grow out that way, why are you going out there? You'll never be able to start a church out there, but they believed because God told them to go, and you and I are sitting here now because of them. When we agreed to buy the Lowe's building. We had a consultant who at the time was the number one consultant in America come. We had this vision, right, that, hey, we think God may be calling us to buy this building. And that consultant in private actually told us, y'all are insane. Nobody's been able to pull that off, okay? I think about when we started recovery. People weren't doing recovery. And People inside the church, people outside the church. Why are y'all gonna reach those people? I will never forget those people, those people. You know what the chief complaint would be about those people? It's just, well, they're gonna smoke out front. <gasps> what? <laughs> what? Fig tree. A ministry designed to be welcoming to our unhoused neighbors. Not try to solve their problem, but just befriend them, become community together. They, they're not those people. They're, they're our people. They're our friends. They're connected to our community. Our whole city and every city in America has got that mentality of not in my backyard, right? Like everybody wants to help somebody that has no place to live. And my question is, well, if it ain't us, then who's gonna do it? But people make fun of us. People are mad at us. People are like, hey, I, I think it's a great thing. We actually had, well, I wish I could. Mm. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Filter, filter, filter. The point is you gotta have thick skin if you're gonna actually do what God asks you to do. You gotta have thick skin. Here's another thing they faced, agony. <laughs> agony. When you read down that list, y'all, they face like, Literal, physical discomfort. They dealt with extraordinary pain. We read brutality, torture, suffering, sawn in half, like stone to death. Now, it does not happen here. And I know social media and sometimes the media tries to make us feel like we're under some great oppression as Christians. We are not. But when you look across the globe, y'all, there are people who are straight up today, right now, making their way to a house church and they are facing a life or death situation. 
It is estimated that there is more physical persecution for following Jesus today than at any other point in church history. And part of our calling is we need to suffer with those who are suffering. We must do what we can to support missionaries and those who are taking a stand on behalf of Jesus. We need to support churches and communities around the world who are facing persecution. Agony was legit. Here's another one that I think sticks out. Uncertainty. That's one we can relate to, uncertainty. A lot of times God calls us to do things and they're not gonna seem like they're working out. I don't know if you've ever been there. If you think about it, it's not a good battle strategy, right? When you've got your army gathered and you're looking at Jericho and God has told you to go take that city for the idea to be, hey, I know what we'll do. Let's walk around the city six times. That's not a good battle strategy. And then to believe it's the seventh time, that's the kicker. On the seventh lap, there's gonna be some weird thing in the infrastructure of the city, an architectural flaw, flaw that's gonna make the walls come tumbling down and then we can go take the city. <laughs> Sometimes God is gonna tell you to do something and you're gonna be like, I don't know, like I don't know. Like it doesn't, did I make a mistake? There'll be moments where you're like, did I hear God wrong because it doesn't seem to be going the way I thought it would? There'll be moments where God calls you to take a next step and then it feels like God just completely walks away from you and abandons you. And you're left thinking, well, where are you now, God? I took this step of faith. If that happens to be you and it's been a while since you heard God's voice, you know what you do? You keep doing the last thing God told you to do. Uncertainty is hard. And I know it stinks when you find yourself in that moment where you don't have clarity or you're not really sure what to do next. And the reason it stinks so bad is we don't like to talk about it. And the reason we don't like to talk about it is because we've been sold a lie that doubt is somehow a sin. And I suspect there's more than one doubter sitting here today. And so if there's any confusion over this, let me clear it up. Faith has an opposite but it ain't doubt. The opposite of faith, certainty. <laughs> what does doubt then become? It becomes an occasion for faith to actually shine. But only if we use our doubts as a noun and don't let them become verbs. See, doubt as a noun, that's natural. Doubt is normal. Doubt is human. It's where we hear God tell us something that doesn't make any sense, and so we feel some doubt, right? I'm supposed to father a nation. I got no kids. I'm supposed to lead a nation out of captivity. I got problems speaking in complete sentences. I'm supposed to have a, a baby. Yeah, that's awesome, God, but I'm a virgin. If we were in their shoes, we'd feel some doubt, would we not? But it's at that point you got a critical choice. In your doubt that you feel, do you choose to cave into that doubt and step back, or do you lean into that doubt and use it as a springboard for faith to say, I don't know everything that's going on here. I'm confused, I'm scared, I doubt, but I'm gonna push through that as best I can, and when what I know in my mind is contradicting what I know about God, I'm gonna go with God. That's what it means to live a life of faith. Uncertainty is a part of following God. It cannot be avoided. But it's this mentality, right? I'm gonna feel doubt, but I'm gonna choose faith. So now the question becomes, well, how do we handle pressure when it comes our way, right? Like the million dollar question. Stephen, you have drug us through this for two months. What is the bottom line, man? I get it, live by faith. Well, here's how you deal with pressure when it comes your way. Number one, you have to understand pressure is a privilege. Stephen, I hate that, me too. Pressure is a privilege. What I'm saying is you gotta change your perspective on pressure. Think about it. <laughs> to have any pressure at all in your life means what at the most fundamental level? It means you're alive, right? You put a cuff on and put some air in it. It registers you got some blood pressure. At that point, you're like, thank God for some pressure, right? You could not see without pressure in your eyeballs. 
You could not drive without pressure in your tires. You could not accelerate without pressure in your foot. See, we need to remember pressure is a privilege because like so many things, a lot of us, we actually prayed for it. No, I didn't. Stephen, who prays for pressure in their life? You may be thinking, well, hey, I got some pressure in my marriage. Did you not pray for your spouse? That God would send you somebody you could live the rest of your life with? Stephen, I got, whew, I'm exhausted. I got pressure with my kids. Weren't you struggling to get pregnant when you believe God for kids? <laughs> See, what I'm trying to say is we can't get angry when the answer to our prayers causes us consternation. Like, you can't have it both ways. It's an honor to be trusted with a trial. Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for him. It has been granted to you. It is a privilege. Number two, navigating pressure requires perseverance. Back to my buddy, Jeremy Renner. He was recently asked, how do you learn to walk again? His answer was simple, one step at a time. And then he said this, these are the words of someone who is grateful to be alive. <clears throat> he said, I've lost a lot of flesh and a lot of bone in this experience, but I have been refueled and refilled with both love and titanium. <laughs> That's sick. <laughs> I have been refueled and refilled with both love and titanium. You see the perspective switch? If you got yourself ran over by a snowplow and somehow survived, wouldn't you think you'd be a little angry? I would. Do you think that anger might grow into bitterness when you're not getting better and it just seems like what you're going through is never gonna end? I would. Would you not be tempted every day to play the victim? All oh, my career's over, I'll never act again. I was just out trying to help somebody like I've done a million times before, and then I got ran over by my own snowplow. I'm not just embarrassed, I'm completely broken, and I'm not sure I'm gonna come out of this. Just yesterday I heard him say, I think I'm gonna be dealing with this for the rest of my life. But he had a different perspective. And maybe, just maybe, he knows that one step at a time, just like it is for you and me, you can become stronger. One step at a time, you can become better. One step at a time, you can become more grateful. And one step at a time, just one step at a time, you can become ready to help other people in the midst of the things that life is throwing at you. Last one and then we're done. Perspective is the key to not being crushed by the pressure. Perspective is key to not being crushed by the pressure. Last summer, one of the most horrific things that I've read in a headline happened. You may remember the Titan submersible. Um, it was a group of people who were trying to descend down to see the ship that people said even God could not sink. And very quickly, everything went wrong. I mean, it was horrible, and my heart still breaks for their families, and I'm not trying to exploit their situation, it just seems like a perfect example. I didn't know a lot about submarines till that happened. Still don't know a lot, but I did learn this, that an implosion of a submarine takes place only when there's not an equal pressure on the inside pushing out that matches the pressure being exerted from the outside. Therefore, we need, if we're not gonna be crushed by the pressure that we're gonna face in life, an equal and opposite pressure on the inside that's pushing out because all of us have got tremendous pressure pushing in. If you read Hebrews 11 and go, well, how did they not get crushed by what they faced? It's because they had that internal pressure, right? And that internal pressure was called perspective. They understood even though they didn't have all the answers. And they understood even though they couldn't see around the corner and they just sort of felt like God was gonna meet them there. They believed God was gonna meet them there, but they weren't sure. They had the perspective that what they know about God, he's a great big God full of love and grace and mercy. They had a little bit of history to know that God shows up and does exactly what God says he's gonna do, so they just, they just stepped out in faith. It was, it was this idea of not the immediacy of the moment, but they had a chance to look long term. 
In fact, Hebrews 12 gives us the answer of their perspective. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that is so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Here it is. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and protect, uh, uh, perfecter of our faith. If there were a bottom line that I would want every person who's associated with Cokesbury Church to grasp, it is this. The bottom line of faith is run. Just run. Well, Steve and I have all the answers. Run anyway. Steve and I don't know what God's asking me to do. Keep running. My knees are weak. My shoulders are hurting. The pressure of life is gonna keep running. I'm looking for some solution. I gotta find an answer. Keep running. I haven't heard God's voice in years. Keep running. Run the race that God has set before you. Doing what? Keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus because he's the first pioneer. He's the one that went before us. He's the one that did everything God asked him to do, came out on the other side and brought freedom to every human being who will freely accept it. So just Run the race. You are not alone. You got a cloud of witnesses. You got a community called the church. People who are pulling in the same direction you are. People who know exactly what you're going through because some of them have been down that same road. Just keep running. That's what God is calling this church to do and that is what God is calling you to do in your life. Just run with perseverance. Just focus on the race that God has set before you and don't worry about somebody else's race. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. It was Jesus that said, it's not about the amount of faith, because I don't want us to be confused on this. In fact, he was saying, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed that you can barely see with the naked eye, you could actually move mountains. So wherever you are today, with whatever amount of faith you got, you may be pumped up for Jesus, or you may have drugged yourself to church Wherever you fall on that spectrum, just keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Now today we get to end by doing something really cool. And I want us to prepare for this. Um, we don't do this very often, but there's some folks I wanna recognize um, in just a few minutes. And so Anna's here and she'll lead us through that. But I've asked Josh, if he'll just sing, uh, you know, like a couple of verses of a song. And um, I don't know what kind of week you've had, but um, Sometimes I find myself just needing to catch my breath, right? Like, it's not anything greater than that. Can I just slow down long enough? Just breathe in God, breathe out His grace. And so that's what this moment is. I don't know what you're wrestling with, but this is an opportunity for us to kind of find our center, to get ready for the rest of the week. And so Josh is gonna do that, and then we're gonna end the service. Josh.